Good evening. Welcome to the September 16, 2015 Board of Education meeting. We've been in an executive session since 6 p.m. discussing a personal con uh, contractual matter uh, regarding the school calendar. Uh, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, I'd like to welcome the PIG students that are here tonight. How many of you are participation in government students? Okay, great. Good, good turnout. You'll get your requirement done early in the semester. Your requirement is to stay until 9 o'clock. If we're, the meeting is still going on at 9, we'll stop. We'll take a break. You'll need to come up and there will be sign-out sheets that you need to sign to, in order to get credit. Some of you also have sheets that you need to have signed by a board member so that your teacher get, gets, uh, requires that also for some uh, teachers. Um, if we get done before 9, then you'll just come up at that point and, and do the sign-out process. Uh, introductions? Christine Beck. Michael Cooper. Lynn Lenhart. Dave Hurst. Jody Monroe. Matt Downey. Charmaine Widgesinger. Diane Stever. Joanne Cunningham. And Judy Kehoe. Uh, second item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of the September 2nd, 2015 regular board meeting. So moved. Second. That's a first and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstention? That item carries. Uh, well, next item is the interim superintendent's report. Jody Monroe. Thanks, Mr. Downey. Uh, so uh, students returned September 8th. Uh, it was a very hot week of school. I'm sure these guys can <laughs> attest to some warm classrooms. Um, we had a lot of athletic competitions that were delayed or rescheduled as a result of some of the heat, but um, hopefully we're on to a little bit cooler weather. It was a great beginning. Um, also, I wanted to let everyone know that uh, uh, Dr. Sal D'Angelo had submitted a request uh, or a, a submission for Be the Change for Kids Innovation Awards through NISBA. Um, unfortunately, we're not selected to receive the award, um, but did receive a certificate and acknowledgement. I think Ms. Lynn Lenhart has that certificate. Thank you. I think this is the fourth year. One of these. Wait, 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 we got a pin for sale. Oh. Do you have a pin? Lynn, can't you do something about that? <laughs> I know, one of these, one of these years we're going to get it. Um, today we had our instructional leadership group uh, meeting. We did a training for APPR evaluations. Um, I think most of you know there's new legislation uh, for districts in their APPR. We also had our committee, uh, PPC committee, meet yesterday to discuss uh, the new APPR requirements and uh, we will be applying for what's called a hardship waiver. Uh, one of the reasons for that is because there's a, the option to use a second assessment for APPR and since there are no approved assessments currently <laughs> on state ed, we thought that it would be best to do the hardship waiver and continue to work through that. So we'll be doing that. They'll, they're elig or we're eligible to begin applying for those October 1st, and there's certain requirements we have to meet. Uh, and on a good note, uh, next week is Spirit Week. It's followed by Homecoming Weekend. So every day I saw a sign today, every day there's a different um, Spirit Day. Uh, next Friday and Saturday when most of the games will be happening and also our Hall of Fame induction will happen on Saturday. So hopefully there will be a lot of people there. And that's my report. Thank you, Jody. Next, the Board of Education report. Uh, I'd like to start by saying, uh, welcoming back the students and the faculty and staff to the school. It, it's great to see the schools being active and busy and, and uh, everyone out and enjoying themselves. Um, also, um, I sent an email to the board today, and uh, hopefully everybody else got it too. But September 29th, uh, the Capital Area School Board Association is having their first meeting of the year, and it's actually going to be a legislative panel. So if anyone can attend, that'd be great. It's going to be at Shaker High School at 6 p.m. on the 29th. 
I just had a quick question regarding homecoming. I know it's coming. I did hear some rumblings from some of the kids why it was scheduled. I know we've done it in the past on the same day as the game. I know there's been some, why did we do it this year? Last year was on different days, so I thought I'd ask. Um, I think that there was a change, um, one, to try and get as many teams uh, during the course of those two days to have home games. Um, but then also they wanted to be able to have the dance following the game so that everyone could attend. In the past, that hasn't been possible because of the way it was scheduled. So this year, if, if all the students and student athletes who have, are participating want to attend the dance okay. that evening, they can. And last year, too, the game was at the University Suny of Albany, Albany. Field, yeah. so that might have made a difference, right, too, that's in true. the planning. Okay, right. thank you. Mike, um, I just want to I just want to emphasize what I think has come come out in different press releases and and whatever talking about you know all that's going on out in public regarding APPR and other items and and just to kind of repeat that you know all that is there in the background but it's really important that that teachers teach and students learn and that's really why we're here and that's what everybody should be focused on and let the political pundits kind of toss things around and try and figure out what they're doing. Um, these are people that I don't think really know what they're doing, but uh, let them try and figure it out. But what we're doing here is really important, and I just think it's important to, you know, kind of say that. Um, I, I realize uh, several schools are going to be having open houses over the next couple of weeks. I, I appreciate the high school moving their uh, original date um, from. Uh, away from uh, Yom Kippur, uh, and I just want to appreciate the faculty and staff for all that they do to make the schools a welcoming place for parents those evenings. I have a question. Um, so the homecoming weekend, is that the one where on the Friday before that's the pep rally? Pep rally and that's yes. the day that we've had some issues prior with um, some student behavior targeting the freshmen, and I'm assuming where Scott's on top of that, and we're making sure that students understand that that kind of behavior won't be tolerated, and I'm sure you're on it, right? <laughs> okay. Just uh, wanted to make sure. I think last year, maybe it was the year before, we kind of had a big discussion about it, and I think we had, I'd heard a lot in the aftermath of, of it, but. Okay. I also, too, I wonder if, they, is it, if a student government president, representative is here and maybe he or she could, during his or her time, could report out what their plans are. Anyone else? Okay. Moving on, uh, we have two different presentations tonight. Uh, the first presentation is the elementary music presentation by uh, Ms. Mrs. Kate Kloss, our Ellesmere uh, principal, um, and Mr. Dave Norman, our music supervisor. And before they begin, I would like to thank um, Kate for welcoming us here this evening. Uh, last year, we started what we call our road show, where uh, throughout the school year, we host, we're hosted at each of the elementary and middle and high schools for a specific board meeting so that it gives the board the opportunity to come out to the individual buildings, uh, have a, a conversation with the administration in the building, and also give the, uh, an opportunity for uh, parents uh, within that uh, building to come to the meeting and have a, a closer interaction with the board. So uh, thank you for hosting us tonight. Kate. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dave Norman, the K-12 music supervisor. I really feel like I'm in the company with a lot of folks who already know a lot about our music program. I know there are many music parents here on the board, perhaps some in the audience. Uh, there are many uh, music students in our group this evening, some of whom have played or are currently playing in my band at the high school. So. 
what we're trying to do this evening, uh, and I also want to thank Kate as, as the host of this event and the board for the opportunity to just kind of reiterate a few things that you may already know about our music program and maybe give you some information that you didn't know. I think what often happens with school music programs and particularly music programs in districts like ours, which are really excellent programs and feature fine performing groups, those performing groups tend to be the, the, the public face of the program. And in many ways, and justifiably, that tends to be the measure, particularly at the upper level, at the high school and at the middle school, that tends to be the measure that a community takes of its music program. But the music program really is much more and really the heart of the music program and uh, a part of the music program which every student in this room right now and every student in the district participates in and we, we hope derives the, the, the gist of our music education is the general music program. Our philosophy as a music edu education program K-12 is that music is really essential to, uh, to the whole person, to intellectual, affective, and physical development. We do a lot of skill work in music, a lot of movement, so it is really a discipline and an area that coordinates the whole brain and involves the whole being. Now there's a lot of anecdotal and, uh, and scientifically substantiated evidence that correlates music, participation in music with academic achievement, and there's ample, uh, there's, there's ample press and, and support for, for that. But that's really beyond the scope of what I want to present and I think what, what Kate wants to present tonight. What we really want to emphasize is the importance of music as an area in and of itself. And I think that uh, if, we, if you were to speak to any of our student musicians in the audience here, I think they would probably support the fact that it's, it's not how music enhances their academic development, even though that's important, that keeps them coming back to participate in our music program. But it's the unique thing that music does in affecting the entire being. So that's, that's very important to keep in mind because really that's what drives so much of our program. We of course think that music is fundamental to personal expression and enjoyment and enrichment. And it also is essential to understanding our culture and our, our greater society. <coughs> our program is of course still in this era of, uh, of shifting standards and shifting definitions of what constitutes an essential education. The New York State Learning Standards in the Arts still provide a very good, very succinct uh, approach to art education, creating, performing, and participating in the arts. Our general music curriculum is really founded in actually doing music, not just learning about music knowing and using arts materials and resources that's of course important and our music education curriculum deals with the knowledge essential to understanding music responding to and analyzing works of art that of course speaks to an understanding of music history and the cultural dimensions of music have so much to do with how we perceive and respond to our society today. So those are just a few of the important guiding principles that we use in, in, in developing our music education program. And Kate Kloss has some comments about some of the nuts and bolts of our elementary music program. So our elementary music curriculum is um, pretty comprehensive. We don't just um, learn ta-ta, ti-ti-ta, and dance around the room like maybe um, some of you may have done when you were in music class in elementary school. Um, it's what I did, although I love my music teacher very much. Um, our, our students learn a lot about music history, about music literacy, instruments, and movement, and so on. Um, so how do they go about doing this? 
to sing. Um, our elementary music program consists of general music classes, of chorus, and of instrumental lessons. In the primary music classes, they meet once a week for 30 minutes. Um, they do a lot of movement. They use some of the instruments, like those you have on your table right now. Um, these big, tall tubes here, and ones that you have on your table, are called boom whackers. And <laughs> when you use them, um, they make different vibrations. And then children can play them, use them to make songs. My um, video clip here that we, we can't have um, work on this computer, but it shows a little bit about how even at the kindergarten level, the children are playing instruments, they're learning songs, and they're learning about music. Um, our little guys come to us at five, even four years old, and many of them don't know how to read, but they sure know how to sing, and they know how to shake it, and we use that to our benefit to really have a springboard for what it is that they're going to do in literacy and all the other subject areas for that matter. So the primary music class is a really fun place to be and a, a real learning opportunity as well. If, if I could in interrupt Mrs. Kloss for just a second, it's not just children who enjoy the boom whackers. They <laughs> happen to be the favorite musical instrument of at least one adult in this room. And I encourage board members who have the, the boom whacker in front of you. Please feel free to experiment with them. They're great stress relievers, and they are <laughs> tuned to particular pitches. I don't know if we have time to actually teach a tune tonight, but I just wanted to throw that in, how sophisticated the boom whacker is. The magic of the boom whacker. <laughs> you would see, actually, if the video were, were playing, you would see children playing songs with the boom whackers. They don't whack each other. <laughs> They're given explicit instructions. <laughs> right. Actually, that place where the sticker is in the middle is where they have their hand, and they, they just um, knock it onto the floor like that. Yes. The intermediate music classes meet once a week for 40 minutes. Um, you can see in the slide here, um, some of our classes learn to play some instru basic instruments, like the recorder. But it really, um, they focus on music as cultural expression. They um, are reading music at that level. Uh, they're caring for instruments, learning about them. They're learning about musicians and composers and the history of music as well. Choir is for our fourth and fifth graders. Um, it is optional, but nearly all of our children um, opt to participate in choir. Um, they meet 40 minutes a week. They meet as a fourth grade and as a fifth grade, and then sometimes they also meet together um, in, a, in a choir. They sing in harmony. Um, they learn the voices. Um, it parts, it's really beautiful. If you haven't had the opportunity to come to one of our concerts, um, I would highly recommend it. It's quite amazing to hear the children sing, and usually it's um, at least 100 children participating, uh, all singing together at the same time. The selection of songs is uh, based on usually seasonally, but also um, culturally, it helps to extend the, the students' learning as well, and to being part of a group. Band and orchestra are open for our fourth and fifth graders. Orchestra begins in fourth grade, with string instruments, and then um, children can opt to continue in orchestra in the fifth grade, or they can also then try a band instrument. Uh, the lessons are offered in school. Um, generally, they're small group lessons, although if they are the only tuba, for example, they may have an individual lesson. Those are on a rotating basis so that they don't miss the same um, subject area or the same class more than once every eight weeks. Um, they do have full rehearsals with the entire band or orchestra before school weekly, and um, they also have spring and winter concerts as well, and often those are in conjunction with the uh, choral concerts. Back over to Mr. Norman. We have a number of special events in our department. Each year we have a district festival. The festival rotates between the major discipline areas, the major performing group areas, band, chorus, and orchestra. This year is a band festival, and that means that all of our district bands will combine. We'll begin rehearsing for that uh, in uh, really shortly after our fall concerts. 
we begin rehearsing, and that includes our fifth grade bands, even our beginners participate in that festival, and it's a great event. It's one of the highlights, really one of the milestones of the year for our department, and we like to think for the district. We always have a very prominent guest conductor or composer, sometimes both, at our festival, and it's, it's really a great experience, and we, we do get our students in all of the participating groups involved as quickly as possible. And one of the great features of these district festivals, and it's, it's particularly terrific to, to look at these groups laid out in front of you uh, up in, uh, in lower Jim B at the high school. When, you, when you're up on the mezzanine and you see the sheer numbers, uh, it really gives you uh, a special appreciation of the level of participation in the department. And one of the very important things for us is that each student really becomes a teacher in this department because as a student grows and advances through middle school and high school, those students are side by side with our younger students in the elementary school. And that's really, that is probably, uh, if not one of, it may, it, it may be the single most important, fa the single most important element of our annual district festival is bringing uh, is bringing the whole department together so that the older students can demonstrate and can model for the younger students. So that's a very important event. We have NISMA solo and ensemble evaluation. Typically the, the ensemble evaluation, what we call major organization for our ensembles, begins typically in the middle school. But solo evaluation uh, often begins in the elementary. Uh, we have many elementary students who do participate in annual solo evaluation in NISMA. Again, uh, many of the musicians sitting here tonight may have actually performed solos as early as fifth or fourth grade. And we have presentations by noted clinicians and guest artists, not only our, our festival conductors and composers, but we also try to, whenever possible, bring guest artists into our classrooms. Sometimes we can have different artists establish uh, multiple day residencies in our elementary schools with the support of, uh, of, our, PT, uh, of our parent teacher organizations and our Bethlehem Music Association. So we try to provide as many opportunities as possible, not only within the district, but also from our larger area. We are, of course, committed to meeting the needs and expectations of this great district. This is a very diverse district. Uh, it's always been very supportive of the arts generally, music specifically. It's really a great place to, uh, to practice our craft and our art, uh, and, uh, and it's uh, a great community for music. Uh, it's, it will not surprise you to hear, hear me say that I think we have a very dedicated, knowledgeable, and creative staff. We also have a terrific support organization in the Bethlehem Music Association that provides us support for instruments, for programming, and for so many different things, uh, provides uh, financial support to students who are participating in honor ensembles. It's a great organization. We, of course, uh, have access to, to terrific musical centers here, uh, New York, Boston, Albany. We really do have access to some tremendous places, including Del Mar. So it's uh, really a great place. And, uh, Many students continue with music well beyond elementary. We have many uh, Bethlehem alumni who are in colleges and universities as music professors and music students who are players in uh, major symphony orchestras, and we often, have those, we often have those alumni come back and speak to us and our guest artists on, in our, our, our performances and uh, give us the benefit of their expertise. And finally, I'd just like to say, on behalf of the music department, thank you. As I've said already this evening, this is a great place for music, and we appreciate your attention and support. Kate, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yes, please, by all means, feel free to experiment with some of the instruments if you get a free moment. And uh, if you don't get to do it here, drop in one of the classrooms. So, thank you. Thank you. Any of the board members have any questions for Dave or Kate? Actually, I, yes. I do. Okay. Um, 
I seem to recall, Mike, I have a kid out of the district now in college and a, a kid who's in the high school, but I thought when they were in the elementary schools that qu choir was twice a week and music was twice a week. Am I mistaken or has, has the number of sessions per week decreased over the last few years? Thank you. And sometimes I'll combine for the, the time just before uh, uh, the Thank you. Thanks. Lynn? Um, Dave, in addition to the students having the advantage of being with older students at the annual festival and for them to see how each other performs, it's really a great advantage for parents, too. Um, well, years ago, we started the strings in third grade and band in fourth grade. And when my son started with the saxophone, I didn't realize how horrible the sounds could be that came out of that <laughs> instrument. And when we attended the, you know, the festival, that was the first one, um, it was amazing to see that, gee, they actually do improve and get better. So even for parents, I think it's helpful encouraging their, their children to continue with music as a result of that. Yeah, the growth is remarkable, particularly in the elementary and early middle school years. If you, if you listen to, uh, if you listen to your child beginning in fourth or fifth grade, uh, yes, there could be some fascinating sounds that come out of that, uh, that come out of instruments, but it, it gets better very quickly, and by by the spring, you would not think there are the same students, and that seems to progress each year. Yes, Mike. Uh, I just wanted to mention that we recently had dinner with some friends of ours from California, and because of the severe budget problems there, their school district has had to get rid of all of the music programming, and they were talking to us about the severe ripple effect of losing that, not just you know from the music aspect, but from the academic aspect and the socialization, because when you play together in a band or an orchestra, you have to learn to get along and play together, and that ripples out throughout not only the rest of their school, but also through their lives. So I just want to thank you for what a wonderful program we have here. Yes. Um, I too, Dave, I want to extend my appreciation and also I, I just, I'm sort of in awe of all that you do. Um, all of the programs and I have, um, now two in the high school, both in the music program and one still in elementary. But I've always been amazed to watch the growth of watching them at those elementary concerts. And then you go to the middle school and they're just that much better. And then you get to the high school and it is just an amazing experience. You and your team do a really, really great job. And I just want to commend you for that because it really makes Bethlehem one of the, you know, it's a real special thing that makes us um, an exceptional school district. And I want you to know, I, I think we all appreciate it, but it really is um, just marvelous. So keep up the great work. Um, I do have a question, and I guess it's probably more for Kate. And my question relates to um, really how we grab kids at the elementary level, because unless you start in the elementary level, you're probably not gonna enter, especially the band or, or orchestra in the middle or high school. Um, when those forms come home at the elementary level, you know, we, we take a look at them, or my daughter, you know, my children were the ones who were kind of excited because they went to the meet the strings or meet the band kind of thing. But I'm thinking about those kids where, and I have a family in my head who I know um, is not, um, you know, they're lower income, they're, they're probably watching their pennies a little bit more than many families in Bethlehem. And I'm not sure the kids are bringing the paper home and waving it at their mom to say I want to do this because there is always a financial piece, you know, you have to rent the instrument. And, and without some sort of reach into them, 
where we actually go to them or go to the parent and say, you know, there are, and I'm assuming the BMA or other resources would supply funding for instruments, um, but are we doing a good enough job at that? Because I think that we need to be really proactive at reaching into those kids. Um, some of those kids don't participate in sports. Um, there's not a lot of extras that go around. They, we have those families in Bethlehem, and we need to pay attention to how we kind of reach into them because those experiences are just unbelievable for a child to be part of the orchestra or the band. Um, and I just wonder if we're doing a good enough job at the elementary level of kind of going in and being proactive and, and grabbing them. Sure. Uh, yes, the district and the BMA uh, have different avenues available for providing financial support. Certainly our position as a department is that we never want finances uh, or money to be an issue for any, any child in uh, beginning or continuing to, partic to participate in our program. The other part of your question is one hard one to answer because how, and, and again, the BMA, we, we discussed this before, you know, to what extent we want to go in and say, you know, if, you're, if, if you need this kind of support, we're there for you. So, uh, because it could be a sensitive issue with, uh, with many families. So, um, I guess if we, if there's any family that that goes that that, that decides not to participate in our program because they think money is an object, then uh, then then no, we're not doing a good enough job. Uh, I don't I don't have a good answer for you as far as that kind of outreach. We can do lots of things as far as just trying to recruit students, and uh, sometimes we'll we'll uh, have days where, uh, for example, the fifth graders will come up to the middle school and the sixth grade band will perform. That's part of our, our schedule and other uh, different uh, recruitment things or things that will help us retain students. The, the question of money, uh, yes, we can always solve that problem, but I, I, I have to concede to you that we, we, often don't, we often don't know about those families. Yeah. And probably word of mouth and encouraging those parents to feel free to feel free to give me a phone call uh, or even one of the building principals who certainly hold it in confidence and do what we can to uh, to make it possible. Right, and maybe and each year we do have a number of students who um, take us up on that offer, okay. and we provide instruments for them here at school and at home as well. It's a very large instrument that they can't transport because they can't take them on the bus. And maybe they don't have transportation available for a parent to drive it in. Right. So. Um, the music department and the BMA have been wonderful in providing these opportunities. So I guess there's some evidence to say that people aren't, um, are, are knowledgeable about the availability of the instruments. Um, I, I don't know about the other schools, but I would imagine it's the same there. Right. Um, I think our music teachers as well um, reach out and to talk a lot about how, just what, how great it is to participate in a band or orchestra. And so any child who has that feeling or that is aware that, that we will support them and that we want them to play an instrument. So um, we haven't had anyone say, oh, darn, I wish I could have participated, but I couldn't afford it. Right. Um, so hopefully we're doing a good job, but maybe there's more that we can Well, and maybe, um, and again, I have someone in my head that I'm thinking of, but maybe there's a way that even the school social workers who kind of know those at-risk families that are struggling a bit can can have it in their heads that this is a resource that's available. Maybe they already do that, but but thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sorry, did you have a question? No. Uh, Kate, this is, pertains particularly to the school, because I know it's the smallest elementary school in the district. Have you been able to field an orchestra, a full orchestra and a full band um, over the last few years? We have a lot of participation, okay. yes. The big gym and for the big stage, you've got the high school. This uh, stage is full. We have a lot of students participating. It's really wonderful to see. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to point out that Elsmere was the first elementary building 
just because of the sheer level of participation and the size of the audience. Elsmere was the first elementary building that uh, regularly scheduled concerts at the high school going back now probably over 10 years because it was, this place was simply uh, uh, literally, literally, or almost literally bursting through the walls. And uh, I can tell you that the level of achievement of the Ellesmere musicians, uh, uh, not to overlook uh, the other buildings in the district, but since we do happen to be in Case House, uh, the level of participation, uh, the, the number of students, and the high quality of participation of Ellesmere is, is, uh, is, is terrific. We're not lacking for any positions. Okay. Absolutely not. Anyone else? Thank you very much. It was a great presentation. Uh, before we begin the next um, presentation uh, on the agenda, it's normally there. Is there a representative from the Student Senate here this evening that would want to give a, an update for us? No? Okay. And then also, any participation in government students that are here, are you alum of Ellesmere here? Any? Any? Would you stand up and be recognized? All right. Good. Welcome home. Welcome. And our next presentation is by uh, Dr. Charles Diedrich. He is the district superintendent for the Capital Region's BOCES, and he'll guide us through an initial dis uh, discussion of the superintendent search process that the district will be going through over the next year. Dr. Diedrich? Yeah. First, I, I would like to um, tell the board that we look forward to working with you on this process. This is the single most important decision that a board of education can make, and it was obvious from my, um, my time that I met with you over the summer um, that I would call an interview, that uh, this board was uh, truly interested in making sure that you ran uh, an open, honest process. So um, when, when I get that feeling, it's always a good feeling to go into a search knowing that. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Lynn Wells. Lynn is the Assistant Superintendent for Instruction, Curriculum and Instruction uh, at Capital Region BOCES. She will be one of the, Dr. Wells will be one of the team members that will be helping in this search. The other person who's not here tonight, uh, Sam Chivette, is the retired superintendent from the Cobble Skill Richmondville Central School District. He has helped with many searches in the past. Uh, he also uh, does important things like he still attends the New York State Council School Superintendents Conference on our behalf. and. Uh, talks to a lot of people about uh, superintendent openings. So, um, and there'll probably be a couple of other people too, but we really try to approach this as, as a team. Um, we find that uh, the, the, the more the team works together with you, the more successful the search will be. The um, fact is um, what, what you've got in front of you is really a, an outline of the information that I garnered from talking to you um, already and um, having quite a few conversations um, with Matt. The, there's really three things that need, to be, that need to be decided before we get moving on this. Uh, one, one thing um, is that we will be aiming for a May appointment, which means an April decision. Um, and moving backwards from that, uh, that means that we'll really have to kick things into full gear come November 1st. But that doesn't mean that things won't be in motion already. Things are in motion already, and we will be moving forward on some important things. But um, some of the answers that you give me tonight will help in determining how we do that. Uh, for instance, one of the, one of the answers that I need to know. Um, there's, there's really three topics. Uh, the nomination um, and slash or application process, 
uh, community input, and um, rounds of interviews. Those are really the three things that I'd, I'd like to get your input on uh, tonight. At a future date, we're going to need to sit down um, in executive session because one of the things that we need to do is we need to um, really hear from the board on the particulars of the type of person that you're looking for. Having to do that in executive session is important because obviously we're going, you're going to be interviewing smart people. And if they hear you saying things, people will be able to adjust what they say to match what you're looking for. So it would be best we'll meet in executive session and go through all of that, um, probably take 45 minutes to an hour. But the first, the first is um, we, we successfully used a nomination process in the last district that we did a search in. And um, it, it really, what, what it did was it brought more people forward who otherwise may not have went through the process of applying because the application process in itself takes a few minutes to do. Um, so I, I, I ask you uh, that, that nomination process. What, what it means is that someone from your community, someone from your Board of Education, uh, someone from New York State could say, I know a person and I'm going to put their name down and suggest that Bethlehem take a look at this candidate. Doesn't mean you have to interview the candidate. It just means that you may want to look at the candidate. And it also means that if the board looks at the candidate and says, yes, this is of interest, then what we would do is we would ask them eventually to fill out the application. But sometimes it helps pushing people forward a little bit. Um, the other thing about uh, the, the nomination process is that what we've found is a, a deeper pool of talented candidates um, as opposed to people who are either trying to leave their former district for one reason or another. Um, it, it may be people that are very comfortable where they are and have a very good, but really weren't even thinking about Bethlehem until somebody mentioned it to them. The other thing about the nomination process is that it does allow for a degree of community involvement as well. If there's somebody in the community who thinks there's someone who could be a good superintendent, they, they can suggest that to you. So thoughts on nomination and or application. When, yes, you said, when you said and or, we can do both. We yes, do, okay. absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I would definitely suggest not doing just nomination. Um, if you wanted to do just application, I could understand that because that would mean that people really had to be interested in this position in order to fill it out. Um, but like I said, the nomination process would increase your pool of candidates and it would allow for community involvement as well. In terms of when you say community involvement, give them an opportunity to nominate somebody. Yes, exactly, yep. People from the community who may not, um, you know, it, it, they, can't, they can't go to fill in the blank who lives out in Syracuse and say, I really want you to fill out this application. But what they could do is they could list that person's name and send it in, and it would allow us to contact that person and say, hey, would you be interested? And so the nominations would go through the search committee? Yes, you guys uh, that's, that's one of the things. Uh, in a nomination process, what we, what we try to avoid is um, ballot stuffing, uh, you know, what, you know when, a, when a group of people get together and say, you know, we really want this person to be the superintendent, let's send in a thousand nominations mm -hmm. for this person. Basically the information we provide to the board is the names of the candidates who have been nominated and what the information is on them. Not necessarily that the person has been nominated a thousand times or just one time. Um, it, it helps cut down on the, the noise, the background noise. A strong candidate will come through, whether they're nominated once or a hundred times, a strong candidate will come through. I think from past experience, the, the candidates' pools have been very limited, whether it was you know, for us here in the past or even from what I hear you know, around the state. 
So I, I suppose anything that we can do to increase the numbers of people to look at, you know, is helpful. So I think the nomination process is good in conjunction with the application process. Okay. Um, the, the other thing about that is that um, well, this is an intimidating district for someone to apply to. Uh, when uh, just a, a, I was the superintendent of a struggling urban district at one time, and somebody said to me, why do you want to go there? And my answer was, there's no place to go but up. Um, in, a, in a district like Bethlehem where you have incredible programs like was presented, your music program, and you, you, are, you are a district that people want to move to. You are a district that people in this region want to be like. That's, that's a, a tough chore for someone to come to as superintendent. So it is, I, I, I need to make you aware of that, that it is you, you have a high bar and you want to keep it there. And that's sometimes difficult for potential candidates. But the fact is that for people that that's difficult for, you know what, you probably don't want them anyway. Probably. Um, the other part of the application process, uh, and this is, this is something that's actually very simple, um, totally online or paper um, and online. And I, I raise this um, because one of the things is the, the cost of the search. You, uh, you, should, you should be aware that, uh, and public should be aware, the cost of the search will probably be around $2,000. That's the cost that we're looking at for this search. Um, Judy, I hope you can free up a couple thousand for that. I'm, I'm I'll do my best. Okay, thank you. Um, on the other hand, if you went to a paper and pen application process, uh, we, you'd probably be looking at adding about four or $500 more to that. Uh, some, of the, some of the searches that we've done recently have all been online, where people fill it in online and they push the button and send it in. Some people print them off and fill it in and still send it in the old-fashioned way, but if they want to use their printer and their ink, that's one thing. So my suggestion is not to do the brochure like you've done in the past, but to do um, the brochure and the application, but have it strictly online. Um, I don't know if you've got copies of the brochure from the last time. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I provided yeah. it to the board members based on what you gave me. So, uh, would it be okay if we strictly went online with this? But the brochure would be there. I mean, yeah, the, the brochure will be there, but it'll be online. If somebody wants yeah, it, they can print it. Right. Yep. We won't incur the cost of printing glossy brochures. Exactly. Exactly. It, it, it really will it'll save four to five hundred dollars. And the other thing is that um, we're finding more and more people really don't want them anymore because it's all we, we put it online anyways. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's. We have stat, it's interesting, from, from yours from quite a few years ago, we only have a, a small pile left, but from recent searches where they decided they still wanted to go with, with paper pamphlets, we have stacks, because people really don't want them. And it's, and it's not effective price-wise to print 50. Our green team would be happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, just quickly. Did you find a difference when you went to just online from the paper and pen? Was there any decrease? No. No. And there's a couple other aspects of it, too, but I'll save that for executive session because it would, um, it, it tells you a lot about candidates. It does. Yep. And this is the 21st century. I kind of, I was just asking the question. No, I know what I'm the, the Everybody, other, everybody's okay with online. Yes, yeah, right. definitely. Yeah. The, the second topic, and it was clear to me the night that um, I, I spoke to you when you were deciding um, what direction you wanted to go with this search, it was very clear to me that you wanted community input, you valued community input, you're looking for a lot of community input. And that was the first time I mentioned the nomination process to you. Um, what I want to make sure of is that with whatever we design, um, it provides that community input that you made clear to us, that you made clear to me back during the summertime that you wanted to have. Uh, based on our initial conversation, what we did was we 
presented to you a few methods of community input. Uh, one is the nomination. Uh, the, the other would be face-to-face -face meetings uh, with, with folks um, in different locations within your community. The third would be uh, an online survey that people would be able to, um, people would be able to access um, whether they're home at 11 o'clock at night or from work and fill in the things that they think are great about this district, the things that uh, need to be worked on, uh, the qualities that they're looking for in a superintendent. And the, the last one would be the actual interview process, um, how, how involved you want the community members to be in the interview process. So we've got all kinds of pieces of that, and we can pretty much design it any way you want. And we can also be a little flexible, especially, especially toward the end, um, in terms of when we're down to finalists, um, who, who those finalists should meet with, for example. But um, those ideas for community input were based on our first conversation, and I'd like to get your feedback. Well, I do have a question in terms of an online survey. Are you able to track what computer it comes from so that, again, someone's not completing the survey multiple times? Yes, and, okay. we can, we can um, turn it off by um, the, the, I, the IP address. address. Yep. I, I like the idea of surveys, but I also want to really encourage the board um, to consider that we host face-to-face um, -face meetings community forums or whatever format that is, I, I really get a lot out of hearing groups of people coming together and, and working together and then reporting back to us. We're, and we can also do the webinar like we did last time when we had a community forum where people could ask questions online or get their input online. We could, we could easily set up something where we did a couple of forums and um, the search that we did in Burnt Hills, Boston Lake, uh, that search we did we, we, what, we, what we did was, it was, um, how to put it, um, it was live on the internet and people could write in questions and ask us questions throughout the event right. and um, what, what that, or make comments about things. And what that did was it allowed for access from people that, uh, number one, couldn't get out. Uh, Number two, people who were really busy and um, the, the time frame didn't work. So that's the type of thing that could be, could, I'm not gonna use the word easily, but it could be set up. They did that format when you did, when we were talking about Clarksville, you could write in mm -hmm. questions and they would ask. I like it where you can come in person and ask online, kind right. of a combo. We did it a few times for different things. Mm -hmm. And I think people utilized it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure we need more like a several nights of doing it. But I think maybe, maybe we just had a couple, a couple yeah, and yeah, maybe would, not choose, like if we chose a Monday one week, then we'd have to make sure we do like a Thursday, I mean different right. days and yeah, times. I'd, like I'd also suggest if you're, you're interested in that is um, doing, doing even at uh, different levels, for instance, doing one in one of your elementary schools and then doing one at the high school um, in possibly different geographic locations as well. If, uh, also if you think we should go to a community location and not a school location, uh, we'd be happy to do that. Obviously, uh, the more of those we do, um, it, it dilutes the number of people that attend, um, but the online survey that we've turned to has really diluted the number of people that attend these things as well. Um, it, it's amazing just in a, in a few years how many more people are comfortable with, being, with answering things online and they don't feel the need as much anymore to, to be face to face. And where you've done it in the past, have you done maybe like a Saturday morning or something again, offering a different time period for people who may work during the week or evenings or whatnot? Yes, I believe Lynn is available all Saturdays to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we can, we can do that. We'll, uh, we'll try to arrange some of that. We'll talk to you about uh, locations and um, we'll try to do at least one or two with, um, with live online feedback. And um, I'll have to chat with somebody, somebody in the district uh, yeah. who can uh, take care of the techn technology needs for me, um, and we'll, uh, we'll discuss that. So the, um, 
The third is the, the rounds of interviews. And one thing that was very clear to me was uh, that this board wants to be involved. Uh, for, I, I'll give you the example. In some instances, um, the search consultants are asked to do the initial screening and the initial round of interviews. I had the feeling from you before that you were very much interested in being part of that. And truth be told, and it's important that I tell you the truth, I like it when you're involved in every step of the process. I like it when the board is involved with selecting who the candidates will be. I like it when the board is involved in that first round where you're kind of sorting through people. Um, that's, that's a lot of responsibility for search consultants. Sometimes consultants are given that responsibility. Um, but it was fairly clear to me that this board was interested in um, that hands-on part. And I just wanted to make sure tonight that, that you are. I wanted to confirm that my read was correct and we'll make sure that you're involved in that part of the process. In, in all the screen, you'll see every nomination, you'll see every applicant, well, you won't, you'll see the nominations for each individual. You'll see the applications for each individual. Um, we will get together with you and you'll select the candidates um, along with our help on who you're going to interview. Okay. Yeah, so Chuck, I have a quick question about the actual, I guess no, no, the electronic might be different. I remember the last time around, I forget where the applications were housed. We all had to read them ahead of time. But if they're electronic, are you going to send them to us electronically or how I does could, that work? I could, but we don't, I don't like to. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, it's, it's rare that I don't like to do something electronically. Mm -hmm. Here's where I lose a point with the green team. Um, one of the things that, one of the things, that, and this, this is not, I, I'm not slinging arrows at any individual board member. Um, when, things are, when things are transmitted electronically, they're very easy to pass along. And they're also very easy, it's very easy for a mistake to occur. Um, what, so what, what we normally like to do, and now I know that a person anyways, if there was something that was of interest, you could take it, you could scan it, you could get it electronically, and then you could do whatever you wanted with it. But that is a little bit more of a step. What we normally do is copies are made of the cover letter and the application. Um, because the application is essentially the resume stuff anyways. And then we have all of that available as well. We, we would get that to you, hard copy, about a week before we were meeting to select candidates. Um, what I would normally ask you to do is read through all of those and the old three pile method, yes, no, and maybe. For maybe, um, we would have all that other backup information that we may need for you to see on the night we discuss the candidates. That being said, if you want it electronically, we can make that happen. And that's something you can, you can discuss and decide. And I, I think, Chuck, when you and I had a discussion, that type of review would probably take place off-site the uh, yes. Capital Region both season. Yes, as, as with the first, I, I always recommend that the first round of interviews take place off-site as well, um, mainly because, keep in mind, what you're doing is, again, I, I, I give you a lot of credit because you're taking on a lot of work here. This is, this is time consuming work that you're going to be doing. And um, with that extra round of interviews that you're going to be doing, candidates that normally would be um, anonymous if they were to come to one of your school buildings would, would not be anonymous. So it's important that we keep that at least up until the community interview part. Again, the, I, I, I've said this before, and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up my comments with this. The number one question that candidates ask me is, what's the board like? And that is, that, that is always the question that's asked. I told you that before, I'll say it again. And very often, people, will, people that are interested in these positions will pay very close attention to what the board is like over the course of this search. Other thoughts, questions, comments, anything I can help you with. 
Um, I believe I'm going to get to, uh, Matt and I talked, I think in October, we're gonna try to, we're gonna get some things ironed out based on the conversation tonight. If there's anything that you'd like Matt to convey to me, um, we can easily do that. Um, but otherwise, we look forward to this. I, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Just so uh, then let's kind of summarize where we're at. We're going to do an online application and nominations yes. uh, if people want to be nominated, if, if, if people want to nominate a potential candidates. Um, it'll be strictly online applications. Um, we will do some sort of community form to seek input from the community at large uh, on what their particular um, objectives would be in terms of a potential superintendent for the district. So. Right. And the really, the, one of the really good things, and, an and we'll do a, an online survey too. Yeah. Okay. One of the really good things about that, those community forums and the survey is, it is really good information to hand the person who is chosen for the job, because now they, if, if we get 200 responses, um, which would actually be pretty good, that, that's information from the community that a person otherwise may not have. So it, it's really, it's good information. And the other thing we do to it with that information is the board is the only ones who see that. Um, I, and again, because you can't have potential candidates seeing that information. So the board will use that information to formulate questions from. Mm -hmm. and because we haven't used the nomination process before, for the next meeting, would we have clear communication on how the community can access the nomination form to be sent out. So I guess I, I don't think Chuck would be ready for it at that point, would you? By the next meeting, for well, nomination. I mean, we we certainly what one of the things that um, you have you have a very good communication service here, and one of the things that uh, we have been strong proponents of is a superintendent search page right on your website, where um, people could. They'll go to your home page, and there would be a button for superintendent search. People hit that button. Uh, the calendar is there. Um, all the information is there, the link to the application, the link to the nomination process. But I think the bigger part of the question is, how do we get that out to the community to make sure they know? Um, whether you have any, um, I don't remember off the top of my head, whether you have access to tools to push information out to parents and community members that this is now available I, like I said as a, as a, and then right. I, I, I would suggest we, using that yeah we, we have that at each of our buildings you can sign up yep. uh, you can sign up for multiple sure. buildings so uh, you don't have to be just a parent there are uh, community members that sign up for that service so we, we do have that service and back when we announced um, uh, the plan um, going forward with the search we actually developed that that web page was already put out there with the understand you know with the comment that it's under construction so we, we do have a a link on our web page now to the superintendent search, but nothing on it. But as, as we develop the materials and the timelines, we would definitely put that out there. That's not, not and I go back to my, my first conversation with you again. It was obvious that the board was interested in transparency. Having a page that shows outlines everything is as transparent as you can be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I ask though, would our communication department work in conjunction with your staff as material goes up on that? I just want to make sure there's no cross you know, they, cross purposes or they will uh, they will work everything's they will work through. completely okay. together. Um, okay. It will be hand in glove. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. I think back to maybe Christine's comment. Would we develop this timeline first before we start opening up the nomination process yes. and application? Yes, we okay. we need that's what, and we really we are going to need to sit down with calendars and fill in some blanks. Um, okay. But we're also going to have to talk about some things. Um, like qualities and characteristics that we really we we need to hear from the board and the plan is that you would be at the next board of education yes. and executive session and that that still doesn't stop us from being able to um, to do what we have to do um, in order to um, see if candidates are interested as well uh, next next starting next sunday week from Sunday is the New York State Council School Superintendents um, Annual Conference. Um, Lynn will be there, Sam Chevette will be there, I'll be there. Um, there'll be people that will want to talk about this district, I have no doubt. And then NISBA in October. And again, um, it, 
Last year we did a district very similar to this. I spent one whole day sitting in a Starbucks located at the hotel. I was off caffeine by the end of the day, but it was almost like having a line of people wanting to talk about the district, but it's a great opportunity to do that. Thank you so much. I wish you the best of luck with everything you're doing and uh, hope you uh, have a great school year. We'll be talking a lot. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, the next is our, uh, at this time, the board would recognize any visitors in the audience who would like to address the board on an agenda item. Anyone want to address the board on an agenda item? No? Okay. Um, finance. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the following finance action items A through E. Some of second. First and second. Any discussion? These were all reviewed by the Facilities Committee. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That item carries. Item number uh, eight, professional personnel. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the following instructional staff action items A through L. So moved. First and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That item carries. Item number nine. Support personnel. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the following support staff action items A through J. So moved. Second. First and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That item carries. Item number 10. Correspondence for action. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the following correspondence action item A. So moved. Second. First and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, is there anybody in the audience who would like to address the board on a non-agenda item? Yes. If you could come over to the microphone, Ms. Smith, and uh, state your name. You're being televised. So. My name is Kim Smith. I'm a counselor at the middle school. I've been in Bethlehem for about 27 years. Um, I have a concern about the district not meeting the needs of our ENL students. ENL stands for English as New Language Learners. In the past, it was referred to as ESL, English as Second Language Students. Um, this summer, we had new students enroll. Um, one of the positions, or a point two at the middle school, was removed from our middle school ENL services to provide support that was desperately needed at the high school. But at the same time, a point two at the high school was removed and reassigned to um, split an economics course in half that was very overcrowded. Um, the New York State regs for ENL students have increased dramatically, but I think we're falling short even if we were to look at our old prior regulations. I know um, and have as my students, the students that are at the middle school, all the ENL students and their families are my students. <laughs> as well as many, probably 99% of the high school students at the high school who are English as new language learners had been my students at the middle school. I met with these families as they entered our country, oftentimes meeting with them with the aid of an interpreter. And I got a sense from them, they looked at me with trust in their eyes that we as a district would provide for them the same supports we would to any other student so that they would have an equal level to have access to an education to excel in our community. I feel that the cuts at ENL has um, sabotaged that. I have brought with me um, the new ENL regulations, but a letter that I had expressed to our administrative team, um, who I want to first thank for their wonderful leadership to our district, as well to the board who've worked so hard to make our district such an exceptional place. <clears throat> you have to excuse my voice. <laughs> um, the new ENL requirements are onerous and the language and description of students' needs and services is complicated and confusing. It is understandable that the state may be offering districts leeway this year in implementing these new requirements. Of concern, is that if BC used the previous year's standards and descriptions of students' needs and services, BC is lowering our standard in meeting student needs. The elimination of a third period of ENL at the middle school 
affects the program that we are all able to offer our ENL students. The seventh grade students will not have a standalone ENL class available to them. Similar to the high school, summer enrollment increased the program needs for our middle school students. A new seventh grade student testing at the transitional level needed more ENL services than the other seventh grade commanding students. It is false and misleading to say that the transitional students' program needs are being met by the reduced ENL program when the class needed is scheduled during the student's lunch. We do not say a child's accelerated math needs are met when the class she or he needs is scheduled during their lunch, nor do we say we are meeting a learning disabled student's needs when their resource room is scheduled during their lunch. Additionally, a third period of ENL scheduled during that period nine would have allowed a student to have the district's second lowest score on the New York State fifth grade test to be able to attend a pull-out AIS math class that was also scheduled during the period eight. We need to honorably meet the needs of all of our students, both the children of our neighbors and friends who speak English, as well as the children from families who may not understand English nor our educational system. With the largest growing refugee crisis the world has experienced since the Second World War, it is alarming how unprepared BC is to meet the need of our current ENL students. It is not to the BC standard to use the leeway in implementing new regulations as a rationale to obfuscate a decrease in ENL services. So I ask that the board please meet with our ENL teachers and find out how we are not meeting the needs of our ENL students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I'll make sure the board, each board member gets the letter. Anyone else who would like to address the board? Okay. Future meetings. Um, one that's not on here is we um, had had a retreat this past week, uh, first uh, session of a board retreat. Uh, we will be having another board retreat on September 28th, Monday evening, beginning at 4.45 uh, for the board. Uh, next public meeting is Tuesday, September 22nd. Oh, and that's not a public meeting, that's the audit committee meeting. The audit committee meeting will be meeting Tuesday, September 22nd um, at the high school in room B115. Um, will the, uh, our accountant be presenting the financial statement to us? Yes. Okay. I'll try to make that meeting if I, if I can make it. Um, then the next public meeting is Wednesday, October 7th with a 6 p.m. Uh, anticipated start time for executive session and a 7 p.m. regular board meeting. That board meeting is at the high school. Um, again, uh, Dr. Diedrich will be meeting with us in executive session that evening. So, uh, and the next meeting after that would be Wednesday, October 21st, right? Yep. Do we, th do we think starting at 6 on the 7th, looks interesting, uh, starting at 6 on October 7th, um, is that gonna give us enough time with him or do you, should we consider starting at 5.30? Uh, 5.30, yes, 5.30 work for everyone if we... On the 7th? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks for me. 5.30, okay, then we'll be commence uh, executive session at 5.30 at that evening. Okay. Um, we, yes. So the next meeting after the 7th is the 21st? Yes. So is that gonna be difficult because of the NISBA meeting? Um, actually, Mike had raised that issue, but when we talked, to, if anybody is worried about access to the portal, we would have um, Jody bring the materials to the board meeting. Okay. Then everybody will be back by Tuesday evening for uh, okay. the, the conference, I won't right? I will be able to be at that meeting because I'll be out of town yeah. the okay. rest of that week. Mm -hmm. We also have a policy meeting on the 14th. Uh, okay. So, we also um, have a facilities meeting. Brittany, on it's 7.30 in the morning some, someday. I know. Can you remind me when that is? We have a uh, facilities meeting on October 1st at 7.30 a.m. October 1st? Correct. Okay. 
Okay, and um, we do need to go back into executive session to discuss a um, personnel matter. Uh, however, we do not anticipate making any um, decisions as of that uh, executive session, so we will not be voting again in public in the public session afterwards. So. And Matt, related to the last um, speaker, I'm assuming we'll have um, some good follow-up sure. discussion sure. related to that. I do remember, I think it was at Glenmont, we had that presentation on the on the new regs, which I was under the impression were not, were still in draft. Correct. I thought. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Um, and can I, ha so can I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. First and second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, we will go into executive session. Pig students, if you could come up and you can sign out now. Um, there will be sign out sheets and we can sign your uh, forms for you. Put your name here and do you need a signature of a board member? Okay, so I'm going to sign.